she had to come to a point where she was able to let go of this future because she she didn't even know what if it never happens you know mm. what if it never happens and 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 to say i by by waiting and by the pain i'm going through i'm even more united to jesus you know and and that's all she wanted you know she wanted to share what jesus shared and she wanted to share everything that he, the beloved went through and so she saw this waiting in this time of trial as her way to share in the agony in the garden and and really it it led to this spirituality of just total abandonment to the will of God. Mm-hmm. Like whatever you want, you know, because I can't control this. And and even if it never happens, if it's your will, then then I'm yeah. happy. Praise be Jesus Christ and welcome back to another episode of Carmel Cast. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Publications. You can visit our website for more information at www.icspublications.org. And right now, uh, this this week, where I'm joined by Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese, and uh, we're continuing our discussion this season on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. We were able to celebrate her feast last week, her memorial, and, uh, and we pray that you had a, a blessed feast uh, of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity on the 8th and that uh, she continues to inspire you as we go throughout this season. I think it was, uh, we didn't mention it last time, but uh, we were starting it on her feast day as a, as a way to, to kind of uh, begin on a good note, I mm-hmm. guess you could say, on the right foot. So in this week, we're going to be discussing the discernment and Carmelite vocation of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And it's a vocation and a discernment that really had... Um, a nascency, you know, it, it began very early on in her life. And um, even, even um, you know, we're going to be talking about some of her early childhood. Uh, her, first, uh, her first time speaking to a Carmelite nun was when she was receiving, shortly after she reser- received First Communion. But even before then, there's, a, there's some inkling that God may be calling this, this young child to be his bride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's, you know, in the last episode, we talked about some of those aspects of her conversion, we could say, her blood, burgeoning spiritual life. Um, and it, a lot of it overlaps, you know, a lot of it's very intertwined with her sense of vocation as well. Because mm-hmm. even, yeah, from a young child, and there's some speculation on, like, what was it that drew, drew her at such a young age, you know? Um, and a real sense, for one, that she was surrounded, you know, by priests and religious in Dijon. So as a little girl, she would have seen it. Um, we know that she lived right across the street from the Carmel. Um, and also just losing her father at a young age and seeing her, her, fa- her um, grandmother, grandfather pass as well. Um, there was a, a real sense of the fragility of life, you know, and that there's something so much more and, and that, that somehow God is your final end, you mm-hmm. know. And so people, you know, biographers have kind of speculated without, you know, because we don't have her own personal testimony necessarily of what made it start. But you can see even in a little girl, um, these were the things that kind of helped, you know, bring her to that point where she, where there is this, you know, one episode when I think she was about six years old, where she, they were with a priest friend of the family and she crawled up on, on his knee and said, um, just whispered into his ear, I'm going to be a nun. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that was a very defining moment. She always remembered it. And she, she makes reference to it later to that same priest, even yeah. after she joins Carmel, you know? So, um, so you see just, yeah, things were happening at a very young age that kind of would bring it to that consciousness. I think the idea of, of exposure, uh, particularly to religious um, at a young age, um, is an important aspect. You know, in terms of in terms of our Catholic culture, um, the the need for to to instill in our, in our young people um, the opportunity, the idea of religious life. Because what we'll see in the course at the course of this episode is that you know maybe Saint Elizabeth had a an idealized sort of idea of what religious life was all about. That would need to be. It would need to be matured and purified mm. over the course of time, but it's in that seed, you know, that seed, even if it's not completely um, completely realistic yeah. in terms of what a nun or a priest, um, a religious, is is all about, um, that idea that that mystery of, of the vocation of the consecrated person um, is something that, that is not lost on, on even, even small children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it I, even at profession ceremonies that I've been to recently where in the speak room after, the, uh, I remember a little girl going up to the nun, and you could just see she was so enamored 
mm-hmm. with this whole thing. You know, the the crown that she had on and just the the whole experience, the 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 witness of the nun. It, I think in in children there is something very deep, yeah. you know, that that we that we shouldn't lose sight of. In terms of St. Elizabeth sort of awakening to uh, her own the own her the mystery of her own soul, right? And it's and we spoke you and brother John Mary spoke last week about um, her temper and and probably probably the, the the material of many confessions in her life, <laughs> uh, her temper and her and in, in sort of acting out in, in, in with respect to anger and various episodes in her life, um, and so even in this, um, I mean, this is something that that uh, you know in, in preparing, I, I had I've had the opportunity to prepare uh, youth for for sacraments and um, the the. Preparation for Saint Elizabeth's first confession and first communion is is a little um, unusual from from my perspective <laughs> in terms of the the youth that I've prepared for the sacraments. <laughs> so maybe we can kind of jump a little bit into that that awakening uh, through the, through the, her first communion and confession. Yeah. Well, as you can see too, like that even that sense of of a vocation didn't didn't stop her from her angry outburst, you know, and didn't and it it wasn't sufficient to totally you know, change her life in that sense. There's something right. deep there, but she still had to go through that process, you know, and, um, and her, yeah, her confession, her experience of, I think, again, her, in her struggle that she needed to depend on God more and more, you know, right. that was so key to her sense of her vocation as well. Um, and then really Holy Communion, you know, because it was, it was a true mystical experience for her. You know, it was, it was the, the immediacy of the presence of God and, and something that she hadn't experienced before. It, it brought something alive in her. And, and as was mentioned in the last episode, how she, was, she had to be so consistent with the truth. Like once she saw something as true, she, just, she needed to live it as authentically as possible. And, mm-hmm. and for her, Holy Communion was... Jesus gave everything to me, and so what else can I do but give everything back to Him? Right. And 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 so it naturally it aligns so well with that sense of of a vocation. She under she understood in receiving the Eucharist the totality of that experience of that of that sacramental experience of receiving Jesus mm-hmm. and and receiving receiving the remedy for her her insufficiency to conquer her own sinfulness yeah, right yeah. it's th- i mean this is why um you know we speak of the eucharist as as the as the primary sacrament of, of reconciliation mm-hmm. because of its its power to annihilate what is <laughs> within us that is that is not of god mm-hmm. you know in terms of venial sin and in receiving worthily of course but this this idea of of when you're confessing the same sins over and over again and and you're coming face to face with your limitations um, and then, and then you you are preparing yourself in the midst of that of receiving the Eucharist, presenting yourself before the Eucharist to receive Jesus Christ. Is it's it's like a, you have to be able to see that connection. Of, yeah. I am I am in need, and this is what I need. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's not a reward for being good. Right. You know, it's it's something. It's 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 the the medicine, the food for the for the week. You know. Right. And 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 so Elizabeth had a deep sense of that. Um, and. And really, and as you mentioned earlier too, right after that moment, she was brought to Carmel. Yeah. You know, even though she lived across the street, she heard the bells. And that was the other thing that probably influenced her hearing all these bells all the time, you know, and just the, the rhythm of the community. And the bells ring a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they ring for us. Imagine how, yeah, 19th century Dijon. Um, and you think, you know, this mystery, you know, it's like, what is this place? And these sisters, what do they do, you know? Mm-hmm. And, but her, her mom brings her to the Carmel right after her first communion. She meets a sub prioress and, and she is given a, a word, you know, yeah. a, that, that really just opened up something for her, yeah. confirmed something in her that she had just experienced. She was such an absorbing little girl. She was able to, she just, she would receive um, something, knowledge, new knowledge about something, and she would just, she would run with it. And it's that whole idea of the totality of the truth. Like mm-hmm. once, once she hears um, an aspect, a word of truth, it, it's something that becomes a part of her. And so the sub priors had explained to her that Elizabeth, her name means house of God uh, in Hebrew. Um, it's the, the, the root of, of the, the etymology of the, of the name Elizabeth, means house of God. And so having just received First Communion, having just received God, God the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus within her, um, she, 
something clicks in her, mm-hmm. and and she's able to experience, and she's able to have this knowledge of God's presence within her, as a result of of uh, her her name, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also of of having just received the sacrament. Yeah, and and you know, in in terms of her vocation too, she, her name was so important to her because mm-hmm. of that. You know, it's like her name signified her path, and that's something. That, that we, we also tend, we can underestimate, but how our names really are given to us in providence, you know, God's providence and signify something about us in our path. And, and so she was so delighted to know that this experience she had just had with the Eucharist, you know, is totally confirmed with who she is, you mm-hmm. know, and that this is her path. Like there's, there, there's a sense that like, even if she wouldn't have said it, or maybe others wouldn't have said it, but she was like kind of already Carmelite, you know, at that right. moment. Um, and, and the way that it's this Carmelite nun who opened up that vista for her. I, I can only imagine, you know, in, in terms of her personality, a very strong personality, very passionate personality, and just how often throughout the course of, of her, of her only 26, she died at 26, we'll get to that later, but even throughout her short life, um, so much of, of these, these sort of milestones that we maybe would take for granted in our own life were, were moments of, of great conversion. Yeah. And um, I think this is this is a, a sort of a sign of a religious vocation when someone is is constantly going through these periods of conversion. We see mm-hmm. it in, in Therese. I'm sure you can see it in your own life. I mm-hmm. see it in my own uh, own life. And and um, and how that that need to be kind of undergoing this constant process of conversion um, as a way of growing more deeper and deeper with our relationship with God, but also coming to a deeper understanding of who God has called us to be. Yeah, exactly. So it goes hand in hand with the vocation. Exactly. And it shows the vocation is not just something like extrinsic that you're trying to find, you know, that mm-hmm. it's like it's so part of who you are. You and know? it's unfolding. Mm-hmm. It's an unfolding reality. Yeah. Um, you know, I, working with young people, sometimes they get they have the wrong idea about vocation in terms of, oh, I missed, uh, if, if uh, maybe I missed my vocation. It's like, well, that's not really how... We understand how God <laughs> works with us, right? It's it's a, this constant this constant rerouting us through through life and and the mistakes we make and the good decisions we make and and uh, He makes all things new. Exactly. So it's it's um, we don't believe in fate or destiny, you know, yeah. in, in, in that sense, in that sort of fatalistic sense. It's yes. it's this idea of of vocation kind of uh, unfolding throughout mm-hmm. the course of our life. Yeah, and it's not like you always see it with the same clarity. Like, you know, Elizabeth had these moments, but then she also experienced darkness and mm-hmm. temptation and different struggles, you know, where it probably always wasn't so clear. But but we have these little windows, you know, as we go along that give us that light that we need. And so for Elizabeth, that was the light so she could keep following the path of her vocation. Yeah. So as she as she grows older, it's, it's interesting. She wouldn't go, she wouldn't see another nun until, until um, right before she was, she was, you know, basically interviewing kind of officially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, how did, how did, it's, it's kind of interesting. How did she, how did she, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt that she lived across the street from, <laughs> from the Carmel uh, of Dijon, but, um, what, um, what attracted her specifically about, about, about the, a Carmelite vocation? As yeah. A Carmelite nun? Well, I think, yeah, I think there's, there's different aspects to it. I mean, for one, um, she didn't originally, she, she wasn't necessarily like when she would talk about her vocation, Apparently, too, she and her friends would talk about apostolic life, like when she's like, you know, 13 yeah. or 14, um, because she was such a great musician. And there was a sense of, too, I could teach kids how to play, you know, use this, these gifts for God in this way. And um, but but she always, too, was attracted to like more the contemplative life, just in a general way. You know, there was something about the pure contemplative life that she just felt drawn to. And, and even that's kind of the strictness of it. And you think as a, as a youngster too, it's more romanticized maybe, but she thought about the Trappistines because they were considered the most austere order in the church and um, for women at least. And um, But then, you know, it, that quickly just became Carmel. You know, it just because Carmel is just so natural. And I, I think, again, like you said, being right across the street, that it just, it was like God just kind of seemed to keep bringing her back to Carmel. But my understanding from from her life is that um, at the age of 14, she received communion one day and it was, you know, through a, a period, she went through scrupulosity, she went through her own interior darkness. Um, but she persevered in prayer and she, you know, was flooded in certain ways with different graces. And it kind of culminated to at 14 where she was impelled to make a, a vow of virginity to the Lord, a private vow, you know, not binding. Um, and it was something in this, this day when she makes this vow that then karma was solidified. Mm. It's like she knew because, and it shows again, the kind of the, 
the balance of her life that, you know, later that day she was playing croquet with a friend <laughs> and, and she, she just pulled her aside and said, I'm going to be a Carmelite. Yeah. And so, you know, in these moments, you know, that, but there was something that just, just was so clear when she made the vow of virginity to totally give everything in her understanding to Jesus who had given everything to her. Somehow that also meant Carmelite. I think, I think we can relate to this on many levels because I mean, maybe there's aspects in our, in our life where in our, in our, story where we have these moments of clarity that, that do bear, you know, come to fruition, they, they bear fruit, and, and it's, it's where we are today. Mm. And there's other moments that seemed very clear at the time, and then, and then for whatever reason, we were brought through a different path. And I think it, it shows um, the, the, the impetus and work of the Holy Spirit that, um, you know, even in, our, even in our desires that maybe aren't going to be permanent desires, that he can um, he can use that that clarity and that that definitiveness um, that sort of surrounds them as a way to kind of get us towards um, in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. And and you know, there's we'll we'll speak about um, within within her own story of coming to Carmel how there were um, a number of young women who were discerning at the same time as her, and and only only a few of them would actually end up entering. Yes. And, uh, and some of them had, I mean, she related to them having this, they had the same sort of clarity as she did about, about Carmel mm -hmm. in that sense. But it doesn't necessarily mean, yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, it's necessary for that moment to help put you on your path. Right. Um, but it is, there's still the whole mystery, you know, and, and, and not to kind of make it even like too enigmatic with, with um, Elizabeth in the sense that, there were other elements, too, that really drew her to Carmel. I mean, she, like, for one, and we mentioned um, how she reads The Way of Perfection when she's 18. Her mother, um, and her mother was, was a devotee of St. Teresa. Exactly. Yeah, her mother, her mother was very kind of, and, 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 you know, talked about her. And it was a friend. Like, her mother saw Teresa as a real friend in mm -hmm. her life, real, a real guide. So that was given to her. Um, and even, like, reading about Teresa's definition of contemplation, you know, and here, here she is, a young girl. And, and we, we can make sometimes think Teresa has this like very exalted view that it's like these, these heights that, you know, you have to be like so advanced to understand. And it's not true at all. You know, mm -hmm. Teresa's so down to earth and she describes contemplation basically as, as God taking over your prayer, you know, and it, he's the one working now. And, yeah. and, and that Elizabeth experienced that and she loved that, you know, it was like, yes, this is so is that, that resonance with Teresa's definition of contemplation, her path. Um, and, even, even to the sense of interior mortification, you know, she was very drawn towards Teresa because Teresa, we know, was sick and she couldn't do a lot of great heroic acts of penance that she wanted to do and that were kind of popular at the time. And and she really talks about this much deeper interior mortification, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Elizabeth, too, knew that that was her path, you know, how to how to kind of in your interior be present to God at each moment and and right. how that takes a heroic effort, you know? <laughs> and even in, within that aspect of, of kind of that nascent spirituality of, of in the moment, in the presence of God in the moment, um, we'll, we'll even see throughout this story about how that even sort of gets even stronger. Yes, um, yes. It's really interesting. It's, it's one of those things you can, you, you see it kind of a little, you know, in, in glimpses in people's lives and then it, it, it only grows stronger and, it, and we'll see that with her. Yeah. Um, and becomes the defining mark of her spirituality, right. really. Yeah. The other thing that too that I think is very, very Theresian about her, um, just in general, is her relation, her relational self. Mm. She she lived in a close knit family, a close knit home uh, with the three, right? Uh, Madame Cates, <laughs> Marie, and uh, and um, and Guit, her her younger sister. Um, they were very, uh, you know, relational with one another. She had. She had many endearing friendships, enduring friendships for, for uh, close family friends, family relations, and grew uh, up alongside family friends, uh, their children of the same age. And so um, even in this, um, even in this sort of, you know, rather natural sort of aspect, we can see kind of a, a, a glimpse of, of a Carmelite vocation because of the relationality of, of Theresian prayer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that, was, that would have been so connatural. For Elizabeth and, and, and to see to her friendships, how they shaped her spiritual life, you know, just like Teresa says, you know, God gives us these friends on our path to help us grow, you know, and, and they were definitely her friends, her relationships were, were, were mediators of of the way God was forming her. Just in terms of her, her growing sort of convert, convert, you know, experiences of a conversion over time, I think um, 
you know, the, the, the main thing that was really attracting her was though it was the, I don't want to call it the, the, the temporality, uh, or the place, but it was, it was just for her, it was like this, this thing of where her, her desires could be fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. It's like, she's, she has this idea of what's going on across the street <laughs> and she just identifies it with the fulfillment of her desire mm-hmm. to, to, to give everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's I think that's the thing that would need to be purified ultimately yeah. because it, it's a great desire right yeah. it's a great desire but um, w- sometimes when we when we're constantly kind of placing um, placing kind of our trajectory into the future into a particular place that's that's in a state of becoming has not yet arrived yeah um, we can we can lose sight of what God is doing to us right now mm-hmm. definitely it's almost like. If only I can just get there, then yeah. I can give myself totally to God. <laughs> you know, if I just get to this vocation, enter the convent, you know, and, and she, it was, it was so strong in her, this desire, but, but there was something, yeah, imperfect about that. There's something yeah. that, that needed to be, to be remedied a bit. And, and we can see how God had a plan, how to purify that and, and help her develop a spirituality of the present moment. That was, that would be so important for, for, for us. Yeah. You know? A lot of our understanding about this time in, in St. Elizabeth's life comes from uh, volume three of her, of her complete works, which was, uh, wrote, was, was completed in the late 70s in French. Um, and, and in the 80s, volumes one and two in English. Uh, volume three is coming soon. But a lot, of, a lot of the material about this stage in her life comes from volume three. And so I have, those of you who are watching will see I have this... Uh, <laughs> This, this quite extensive manuscript form of uh, volume three that we're, we're presently working on. So we'll be reading a little bit from this text um, just to, just to kind of give a plug of what's coming next year in terms of that being, being published uh, and, and the complete works being made complete in English. One of the interesting things that is uh, there's new things that have been discovered. So mm. we even have, and I'm going to actually be reading from one of them during today's episode of a newly discovered letter that uh, is not even available in the French edition. Uh, well, actually, it just became available this year in the French edition. But anyway, I just want to read um, from this volume. Uh, up. Elizabeth was very had a very poetic heart. She had a poet's heart, and she's she often expresses herself and her her life and and um, you know almost almost like what you'd expect from a teenager in in the form of a diary. And she did have a diary as well, but she. She really laid herself out in, in her whole self out with respect to writing poetry. Um, and this is a poem that she wrote in 1897. We think on the Feast of St. Teresa, actually. Um, and the title of the poem is What I See from My Balcony. Hmm. Um, and you can kind of, you'll, you'll get a sense of, of what's going on uh, in, in, in this very sort of beginning stage before, right at the cusp of, of her vocation is, is going to be, begin to be challenged a bit. Um, What I see from my balcony. My room is very simple, very small, but with its large balcony, I love it. Since from there, I can see the Carmelites and hear the sweet ringing of their bells. How many evenings I go there, sad and dreaming, to contemplate my beloved Carmel, while its tuneful bell rises sweet and slow to the sky. Around me is all is, around me all is silent. I am alone in this delightful spot. So I can allow my tears to flow, for only Jesus can see my distress. I see tiny windows of the humble, poor little cells. I see the simple yet graceful bell tower as it rises up toward the skies. I see the mysterious chapel of the nuns, humble and poor. The chapel where I will have the happiness of giving myself to the Lord. I see their beautiful, solitary garden with its great ancient trees. I sometimes see the humble sisters diligently working the land. Holy daughters, how I envy you. Delight in your good fortune. Pray for a future sister who would love to share your life. Pray, pray that the Lord may soon make me your humble sister. How happy and proud I will be to climb Calvary Calvary with you. Then, O dear little balcony, from where I hear their sweet chimes, from the window of my cell, From that tiny attic window, I will bid you forever farewell, having preferred that little window to you, O precious balcony, to be a lowly Carmelite. (laughs) So in this, this, this little, you know, poem that she, she's written, um, on the feast of St. We think on this, on the feast of St. St. Teresa, 
um, we see a very idealized um, form of religious life, sort of a, an outwardly oriented uh, understanding of of a uh, of vocation, mm-hmm. right? In terms of the trappings, in terms of all she really, and it's not her fault, it's all she knows. It's, yeah. it's all, her only experience of it is, <laughs> is what's across the street. <laughs> um, and, and so there's, there would be a frustration, I think, in her to have this this in front of her, kind mm-hmm. of taunting her. And, you know, she speaks of how envious she is of the sisters and how she just, all she wants is to be on the other side of the street. Mm. Um, and, and what would ultimately need to be happening is when her, one of her biographies, Joanne Mosley, speaks about this this need for that outward orientation of her vocation to become inward, mm-hmm. um, and and this is really what what um, is is at the core of her message, right? This this inward reality. We yeah. can have these outward oriented desires, but what really needs to happen is is that we become so internalized, our vocation, sense of vocation, becomes so internalized that that um, we could be thrown in jail and be able to still yes. live our vocation. It's yes. not about the place. It's not about it's not about the people. It's mm-hmm. not about the the uh, exterior reality. It's about it's about what's going on inside. Yes, exactly. And what would be that? You know, because you need a strong. Sometimes you need something strong to purify that. And and it's a it's part of the process. And for Elizabeth, what was the thing that was so close to her? You know, that that gets hits to the very core of who she is. That would that would kind of be an obstacle to her. You know, and and. Well, I just know uh, the one, the, the main obstacle to her vocation was her mother. Yeah. So, and, and like her relational sort of uh, her being, you know, uh, and that, that intimacy of that home that, that was so important to her. Um, her mother was, her mother was um, very difficult with respect to this vocation because, um, uh, you know, she would kind of, she would kind of vacillate between you're too young, mm-hmm. um, you'll never be old enough. <laughs> um, you know, just this, this vacillation between, well, maybe, maybe in a few years and, um, you know, no, not yet. This, this sort of, this sort of, um, kind of really kind of, you know, bringing her along, yeah. uh, in terms of, in terms of her desire to become a nun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to say else about, about that, um, with, I know we're going to talk about her mother and, and her illness too. Sure. But I think, well, it's, it's just the paradox of it all too, because here's her mother who introduces her to St. Teresa of Avila, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, brings her to the Carmel after first communion, you know, but, but then her mom too, she, you know, she, she's been through a lot of her own stuff and her daughters were everything for her. You know, she lost her fiance, she lost her husband, she lost her parents, she didn't have brothers and sisters. You know, she gave everything for these two little girls, and, and Elizabeth especially, because she was the most effervescent one, the outgoing one, the brilliant one, you know. And and so so it's like, you know, that's her everything. And so it, it, there's an irrationality to her mother's need for control here. But again, she was a good woman. Madame mm-hmm. Cates was a good woman, and God use that, you know, to purify Elizabeth and to help bring her out of this more idealized, externalized mm-hmm. sense of vocation, you know? And, and I think, I think Madame Cates thought that she could, she could, uh, change Elizabeth's mind too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, I think it was two days after, after Elizabeth first broached the subject with her mother, uh, she, she brings a young man to the house to, <laughs> who, and I think it's even a proposal. There's like a, there's an, some, not in the sense that we know today, but, <laughs> but there's this sort of, this sort of idea of marriage about this young man. And, yeah. and, and so, um, you can already see, I can, you can only imagine what it was going through Elizabeth's mind is like, oh, okay, here we go. I know, <laughs> I know it was, you know, it, the mom wanted grandchildren, <laughs> you know, she wanted her way, she wanted her path. And she didn't, she, she was very fearful, you know, she was very fearful, but, but Elizabeth, she was obedient. That's the thing she knew. I mean, in the end, of course, God, you know, we have to follow God more than anyone, but Elizabeth knew though, deep down that she had to kind of obey, you know, Mm -hmm. even as she got older, even though she was 18, 19, and she could have ran away and joined the convent, you know, but she knew that wasn't for her. So she did have to wait. Um, And that's where, you know, this, her mom's opposition really came in handy because she had to come to a point where she was able to let go of this future because she, she didn't even know what if it never happens, you know, Mm. what if it never happens? And, and, and to say, I, by, by waiting and by the pain I'm going through, I'm even more united to Jesus, you know? And, and that's all she wanted, you know, she wanted to share what Jesus shared in, she wanted to share everything that the beloved went through 
And so she saw this waiting in this time of trial as her way to share in the agony in the garden. And, and really, it, it led to this spirituality of just total abandonment to the will of God. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever you want, you know, because I can't control this. And, and even if it never happens, if it's your will, then, then I'm happy. Yeah. I just want to, uh, it's very apropos that you, you kind of went in that direction because I want to just kind of read some of the development of, of, um, of, of Elizabeth sort of grappling with this through her poetry. And I'm not going to read the whole po- all the poems, but, um, you know, shortly after that, that very idealized poem on the balcony, just uh, two months after that, she, she writes this poem, May Your Will Be Done. Um, and and she says in this, uh, in one of these dear monasteries where the rule is hard and very austere, I would like to share your sorrows, O divine spouse, O sweet savior. Yet you want nothing further from me now. When shall I be able to give myself to you? Oh, if it pleases you to see me suffer without answering my devout desire, may your will be done and may it be forever blessed. Mm. And so this this sense in her of... of uh, of wanting to wanting to give everything, wanting to give everything, and, and having this idea of well, this isn't God's will right now, mm-hmm. and that was very that was very clear to her. So you begin to see kind of this 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 uh, development of her sort of resignation to to that, and to and to be able to um, live it not in the cloister. Yes, begin yes. to live it not in the cloister. Exactly, and this is where, as one biographer put it, this is where her sanctity, her heroic sanctity, really began. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what moved Elizabeth from kind of being this kind of more ordinary girl on this beautiful path to becoming St. Elizabeth of the Trinity um, mm-hmm. is, is this, this need to, to, of this heroic abandonment. And, and to say where, you know, it's like where Jesus is, that's where I want to be. I want to be where he is. It's not about Carmel, you know, it's about him. Mm-hmm. And I want Carmel for him, not, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want Carmel just for Carmel. And, um, and so that, that, yeah, that Christ-centeredness, um, that abandonment, and, and as you said, it opens up to this whole sense of the, the, the lay call to, to mystical union, right. you know, because that, this is where she really entered into mystical union. And it was, it was before she became a Carmelite. And it was, she was going on vacation with her mom and her sister into the <clears throat> countryside, into the mountains. She's going to people's parlors and, and playing the piano and, and staying up late at night and dancing mm-hmm. and things like that. And, <laughs> and so it's in the midst of all of that where she's really beginning to become Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. Yes, yes. Well, uh, eventually, um, you know, Elizabeth would would kind of think that okay, maybe this is never going to happen, and and it was at a point when her her mother, I guess, had had uh, had been bitten by a snake or something. Yeah, and, an adder. Yeah, so very yeah. yeah, something that was that's venomous and and it had affected her health for many years, and she had kind of a turn where it wasn't it was we Elizabeth thought that her mother would be would be essentially bedridden and and need need her care. And so she she again began to sort of to be resigned to the fact of of Carmel never happening, and mm. that she would just have to stay uh, with her mother and take care of her. Mm. And she she writes a year later after that that your will be done, um, and you can you can really see her her wrestling with her the desire, but also with with just letting letting God's will uh, be as it is. She she writes in this in this poem to Our Lady. She's speaking to to Our Lady and to our and to Our Lord, um, and the time has come. O oh, my good Jesus, Supreme Master, you whom I adore, O oh, you who I'm whom I love, yes, I bless your will, and you, Immaculate Mary, Virgin, I have invoked so much. Come to my aid, help me. Let us carry this cross together. Then listen to this prayer. O Virgin, it is the cry of my heart. I commend my mother to you. Ah, may she never know my sorrow. Mm. And, and not only is she sort of resigning the fact that she may never be able to become a Carmelite nun, but she, she, doesn't, she doesn't even want her mother to find out that, that how much this is distressing her and how much it's, it's tearing at her. Um, and so there's this, this, this sort of, um, I don't know, she's on a threshold here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and, 
it, you know, it says a lot too about charity, right? I mean, that you could, cause you think here's the one person that's getting in my way, you know, and, and if anything I can share, you know, I want them almost to feel bad for what they're doing, right. holding me back. And it's like, <laughs> so I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've all done this. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be so easy to kind of have that, that kind of passive aggressive exactly. way to, to sort of, you know, you want to make them know how much this is hurting you. Yeah. Yes. But she knew, she just knew that's not her path. And, and ironically enough, it's, it was her trying to hide her sadness that her mom noticed mm -hmm. at a profession ceremony. I think it was a Carmelite. I'm pretty sure it was a Carmelite. They went to a profession ceremony um, not long before, you know, Elizabeth would eventually enter. And her mom looked and saw how happy the nun who had just professed. And she turned to her daughter and saw her trying to hide her, you know, her just, angst. Yeah. <laughs> just sort of like bursting at the seams and in, in sadness yeah. and, and just sort of longing for what this young woman is going is, is about to receive in, yes. in, in her vocation mm -hmm. um and her mother identified exactly what was going on and as they were leaving the the chapel this is when they are, were on vacation um uh the summer after her mother's sickness her mother got recovered mm. Um, and, and, uh, they're, as they're leaving the chapel, her mother says, don't worry, I won't make you wait much longer. Yeah. And that was really kind of, uh, the, the <laughs> turning point, although, you know, her mother was so, so vacillating with this <laughs> that it was the next day she would take it back. Yeah. Five days later is when that <laughs> marriage proposal, she brought oh, was it, that was, that mm -hmm. was that an occasion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 no, I mean, it's not, it's a terrible comparison, but you, you think of Pharaoh, you know, with the Israelites, it's like, yeah, you can go. And then right away it's no, but her mom was just struggling, you know, but, mm -hmm. but once she said, um, once she said, yeah, you won't have to wait any longer. It was kind of, that was the moment, you know, and then she still was hoping maybe that Elizabeth would decide to stay, but, but the green light was, was given, I think. And yeah. Well, I want to actually back up a little bit mm. in in this story because there was a you you guys had spoken about it last week with the um, the parish mission because I think it, it it shows something that's really important with respect to vocations and and discerning vocation and that's the importance of of good spiritual directors and Elizabeth um, in March of of um, it was March of um, eighteen ninety nine I believe mm. she had uh, this this occasion to go to that month long. Um, diocesan wide mission but it was happened there was a, a particular mission happening in her parish for the course of four weeks leading up to i think holy week and um she was mustering up the courage to go to confession because these two priests were 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 really i mean they were they were working the crowd in order to get them to go to confession <laughs> so everyone was really nervous and the lines were long to go to confession um during this mission but she finally musters the courage to go see um, Père Leon, Père Leon the, the gentle one. She didn't go see the, 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 <laughs> the lamb. The, the lamb. Um, <laughs> but she finally musters up the courage to go see, to go to confession with Father Leon. And, uh, and it, was, it was in this moment, she says that, um, she says it was one of the best con confessions she ever experienced. Mm. But um, the, the, the director, this director was able to confirm in her um, the sense of a vocation of, mm. of a religious vocation. And I think that's an important aspect that we always have to bear in mind that, that, uh, particularly vocations within the church, whether it be a religious vocation, that these are, these belong to the church as well. And mm. so having that confirmation, I think was, was kind of a, maybe took the burden off of her so much yeah. in terms of, I have to make this happen, mm -hmm. but rather that, you know, if this is God's will, um, and, and God's will is happening within the context of the church, then, then, um, you know, this is being confirmed in, in my director being able to see this in me. Um, and, and so this will happen if it's mm -hmm. meant to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and she, you know, she, Elizabeth was very um, open, transparent, you know, with her experience to, to her priest friends, or her director, her confessor, kind of uh, angle, uh, her priest friend who she originally whispered to, you know, when she was a little mm -hmm. girl. Um, and, and so she was always, yeah, she was seeking that kind of that ecclesial support, you know, the church, the, the external also confirmation of, of, of what she was going through, you right. know? So, and that, that's, a, it's an important thing to, to point out. It wasn't like she was just doing this on her own. And it's um, something that, you know, happened with Holy Mother, St. Teresa, it's something that happened with John of the Cross, something that happened with Therese, mm -hmm. you know, this, this idea of, of, um, you know, a, a vocation is not something that is just sort of in your own mind and desire. It's something that has to bear, 
be be bearing in, uh, fruit in the church yeah. right? in terms of that's what a charism is, right? It's yes. This, it's this bearing fruit in the church. Yes. And that, and too, that's why it's so important to know, like, it's not just about doing what seems like the holiest thing, you know, but but it's really is doing what is God's will for you. Like that, that is the best thing you could ever do. So it's in, even in this epic, it's, I think it's kind of original. She, she has a letter to a friend where um, the friend, I guess, was thinking about a vocation and, and is complaining that she's gotten lukewarm in it. And now she's thinking about marriage and, you know, she wants to be married maybe. And, and you'd expect someone, Elizabeth, especially in her fervent young zeal to, to say, no, you know, put that aside, follow the Lord's call. But she says, you know, imagine if every young woman who wanted to raise their children for, or if every young woman who cared about God and loved God um, became a nun, there wouldn't be any women who would raise their children for God, Mm -hmm. you know, they would would just raise them for themselves, you know. And it's just interesting. So she's saying, no, this, it's about doing what, what will actually bring you closer to God and where, where you can do most for God, where you can bear fruit for God. And, and so if that's motherhood, praise God, you know, there's not, that's a beautiful path. Um, and it's not, you don't have to see it as lesser or you're losing zeal because now you want to be a mother, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and Elizabeth is just so original, I think, in some ways of pointing that out and seeing just the, yeah, the, the beauty of following God's path for you, whatever it is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, so the, the Father Leon, who she would go to confession would be the one who would then talk to her, their parish priest and then and, and say, you know, talk to the mother. You know, let's, <laughs> let's get this moving. And so that she's not 50 when she when she can finally enter, you know. Mm-hmm. So he finally, um, she. so the parish priest talks to the mother and there seems to be, mm-hmm. uh, and then Guitz, her sister, younger sister, Marguerite, she also uh, tries to, to, to ease, ease into the, the discussion too with, with some impetus and, um, and, uh, and of course, uh, Madame Cortez is, is, uh, simultaneous. I think at one point she says, why well, I haven't heard Elizabeth talk about Carmel in months. <laughs> she's bearing it all within her soul and it's bursting at the seams and her mother has no idea that she's, this is all going on within all, her. She just, thinks that she's given up the idea of religious vocation. Just pure wishful thinking. <laughs> just like, <laughs> Uh, but she's eventually, eventually, Madame Cortez um, is going to allow at, at least kind of the beginning stages of, mm-hmm. of this discernment. In her mind, she thinks that uh, she still thinks Elizabeth <laughs> is going to change her mind, <laughs> but she allows it kind of to move forward, and she's she's able to go to uh, meet with the prioress uh, and and to begin that that uh, that. Well, it's it's even providential how that all comes about because. Um, there's this whole sort of side story going on within the within the Carmel of this uh, drama with the with the um, with the second foundation. Oh yeah, sure. And yeah. so the the, pri- the the nuns are all praying this novena uh, leading up to the Sacred Heart, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, and they're looking at creating a, a foundation in uh, Monia, uh, pa- what Parade, is it? Parade of Monia. Yeah, where the the, the where uh, Saint Margaret Mary um, was from, and so there's this whole sort of side saga going on and, and they're praying for vocation so they can start a new foundation and within the course of this novena they receive i think 14 girls show up mm. to, or write letters about wanting to enter um and, and elizabeth is one of those she she writes the carmel within that novena uh, and so she's able to meet with the prioress and the prioress is um it's interesting because they, they probably heard the tantrums going across the street <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> <laughs> and here's this girl coming back yeah. for the first time since her first communion and yeah. And uh, and she wants to be a nun, so mm-hmm. it's it's kind of interesting. But they must have been very impressed with her because because they they accepted her for formation. Yes, yes. Not for immediate entry, but uh, yeah. but to begin the process. Yeah, it was they they you can tell the Dijon Carmel like they really had a, a strong sense of formation, you know, and what these girls needed and um, accompaniment. It's pretty they, they it's pretty impressive when you see that, for, and especially in back in those times. Um, there, that lively sense of, you know, having these girls meet together, you know, they would kind of form a little group of their own outside of the Carmel and trying to live the Carmelite life in their own, you know, best they can, um, but have this fellowship with each other and, you know, have different meetings, encounters and, and just, you know, that, that helped to kind of prepare them for the convent life, you know, Mm -hmm. and then Elizabeth grew a lot in that time, that time that she had to wait and the time that she was, you know, so eager to go in, but she grew a lot, and in the in the 
the prioress gave through through a bow in her way in, in terms of uh, she even received her religious name before she entered. <laughs> yeah. So Maria Elizabeth of the Trinity, she knew that was going to be her name in religion even before she she stepped foot uh, before she was even in, inside the cloister. Mm. Um, and and uh, the the prioress was sending her books and and from the monastery library mm. and and sending her um, sending her conferences from the from their one of their chaplains mm. and. And so, really, the her process. And in fact, the the prioress considered she spoke of her postulants outside the walls. So oh yeah. Even considering her to be a postulant, yeah. uh, which is which would be normally seen as something that happens once you enter. Mm. Uh, so it, it's really a beautiful time in her life, and and one that we even in in her writing at this time we begin to see sort of the again the, that internalization mm-hmm. of this vocation. It's not just something out there. If she wants to live this life over there, she needs she can do the work now yes. to be to live it and to have it and to to possess it. Exactly. No matter where she and and the the, the question becomes too uh, at one point that she might not be even in the Dijon Carmel. They might yes. send her to the new foundation. Yes, yes, and I, it. There, there's a, a, a great poem, I believe it's um, called November 23rd, um, where she says, I, I, I um, am not entering Carmel to, to find union with God because I already have it. Yeah. You know, I'm entering Carmel to, to, prove, my, to, to prove my love for Jesus, to yeah. live my love for Jesus. You know? right. um, but it just shows that, yeah, all that she's looking for, she knows she can have it. You know, because it's all available to her based on her baptism, you know, and that's she came, she would eventually come to a deeper understanding of that as well. But and then after she joined Carmel, all that she learned, you know, from waiting, from trying to live this as best she could now, she then taught that. That's what she was teaching to her right. friends, you know, to her sister, the it was, mom. It was so important. And we'll get in, that's going to be an entire episode this season. Is we're going to be yeah. talking about uh, kind of Elizabeth as, as sort of her, her, um, apostolate within the walls and her mm-hmm. letter writing and and basically she's imparting to them what she's gained mm-hmm. before she even stepped foot within the cloister yeah uh, and so there's that that sense of 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 lay uh, of Elizabeth being a lay spiritual master mm-hmm. uh, for for people who are desiring to live a contemplative life within the world yes I want to read two two things from um, from from Elizabeth during this time. Um, to kind of show this is a, a poem. This is one of the newly discovered poems, actually, um, that, uh, that, that has just been published in French this year. Uh, she says, Graciously help me build a cell in my heart. Make me very humble, very small. Construct the Carmelite within me, the soul that only lives in you, its treasure, bridegroom, and king. And, and she also writes in her diary at this time, um, she, she, when, at the age of, she's 20 years old at this point, and um, she's, she's, a, she's pretty close to entering. Um, uh, she would, well, she'd be a, she'd be a little less than a year before she actually entered in within the Carmel of Dijon, um, where a, a 20-year-old would maybe be fantasizing about her, her you know, her wedding day and, and her future, her future home and, and, and arranging the furniture, she kind of takes that idea, and and uh, it's interesting how where she, where she's at within her own spiritual life at this point, because she's speaking of um, this this note she writes, the cell of my beloved. So she's thinking about her religious cell when she will cross the street and enter the Carmel. Its bed will be abandonment to the divine will. It will have a good armchair that will be mortification, and a soft carpet that will be humility so that this divine beloved will be pleased in my poor little cell. I will decorate it with as many flowers as I can, and those flowers will be the little sacrifices of each moment. And I will give to my Jesus renunciation and self-sacrifice for food. A little lamp will always burn there. Its flame will be the love, the love that consumes the heart captured by Jesus. Mm. And uh, and so she has her cell. Her cell and the, and the and the the trap the the furniture of that cell are are not are not the trappings of 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 what we consider or picture in our head as a religious cell, but rather uh, the virtues that she that she is acquiring in mm-hmm. in this moment in her life. Mm-hmm. And and why can't that be ours? Yeah, so. yeah, outside of the cloister, mm-hmm. uh, and even for even for friars. <laughs> <laughs> well. 
So as we continue our season, this look into the life of Elizabeth the Trinity, we're going to be taking a little bit of a turn um, from this sort of more biographical sort of uh, timeline. And uh, the next few episodes, we'll be speaking on various aspects of her spirituality and life. And we'll be bringing in aspects of her life in Carmel as well. So we ask you to stay with us. Join us next week on CarmelCast, and may God bless you.